Okay, the subject of texturing. But first, rant incoming. So, um, when you want to create something, where you're the, whether you're a 2D artist or you know a 3D sort of technical artist, there are three categories that you have to be concerned with. There is a slight shift between the technical artist and the um, the, the, the painter or drawing artist. Um, in that that first category is either problem solving for the technical artist, the ability to take multiple pieces of information in your brain, kind of mix them in different ways, and then come out with a result. For the uh, 2D artist, the person you know painting, drawing, etc., um, it's about hand-eye coordination, right? Uh, being able to lay down a confident stroke and you know know when you move your hand that it's going to give you the shape that you want. Um, both of these come through uh, building, I guess, the muscles that are there. For the problem-solving aspect, you should challenge yourself to little things, little problems, and see what you can, can do to try and get uh, unique solutions. So challenging yourself every once in a while uh, will work your brain into more of a stronger problem-solving mode. If you're the 2D artist, the person wants to paint and whatnot, you know, doing a lot of really lame exercises like drawing circles and squares, doing uh, scale comparisons where, you know, you've got a big square and a small circle and they try and draw them in the same scale uh, and proportion and orientation again and again and again, trying to repeat that shape to have consistency that will develop your hand-eye coordination. You'll get better at, you know, drawing basic surfaces. Those are just pure, you know, overall technical skills. But there's other elements that you require um, in order to create something useful. So n number one, and that that so or actually number two, I guess, is understanding the tools. So if you're using a pencil, you know, um, knowing that you sharpen the edge, you're going to get a finer point. If you take it along its side there and kind of rub it down, you can get uh, fatter lines and use it for smooth shading. Um, different kind of pencils have different kind of feel, different kinds of paper have different kind of feel. You know, knowing the tools that you're utilizing in order to do it, the same would come from Photoshop and Photoshop brushes and stuff like that. And in here, they're the nodes, the nodes that we're using. What do they do? How do they work? And how do we get to that? using them, playing with them, not being focused on trying to make something. Just sit down, pull some nodes, start dragging them all over the place and see what happens. That's how you'll understand the tools, how you'll get comfortable with them. Um, maybe discover a few bugs along the way and report those and then everything will work better for everybody. Uh, so then the final thing is reference and understanding reference, not just staring at reference, but trying to understand, you know, why is that green there? Why does that go in that shape, etc. Those things will assist you in the process of making what you want. So if you do that, then you'll have a better chance of being able to achieve your goals inside any software or on a piece of paper or, or what have you. So I've got something really simplistic for this exercise. And we're going to run through a few different things, including my most common process that I like to use in order to create the base textures. And then uh, we'll look at some more uh, involved methods. So some of these things, you will have seen them in my breakdowns, um, but uh, I haven't you know, discussed them at length. So here we are. I'm going to go in and I'm going to add a soil node. And the default is it's going to give me really harsh lines in there. Cool. I go with graded. I recompute. Now I've got softer shapes, more of a gradient going through that. Lots of the detail that is in here has been pulled into this node. Okay, wonderful. Now I'm going to take another soil and I'm going to plug that into that soil. Now I get smaller detail, and of course this is non-graded, so I get again really sharp contrast. So now I'm getting smoother. Now I have larger detail and smaller detail. If I was going up to 4K or 8K, I may add another soil in there. And it takes a little while for these to calculate, but 
they're going to give me the details if I want to go procedural. I don't have to go procedural. I can pull texture from photograph. I can pull in a photographic element and utilize that and then just use this to blend color values, color changes. So if I pulled in a texture and I wanted something based off this shape, I may take the texture and run it some, through something like a color effects where I darken it a little bit and then I use this to blend where the darker regions will be the lighter color and then the darker colors would be the you know grooves and stuff like that. So you don't have to use these 100%. You can use photographic elements, uh, tileable textures and stuff like that, even hand painted things if you wanted to, to try and blend. These are just useful for you know helping marry them to the shape of the terrain. So if I wanna go fully procedural, then I'm gonna go with this, and I'm gonna go with this. So um, often cases, I like to do a lot of exercises where I try and go 100% procedural, see what I can get from it, what that will look like, you know, what are the limitations within there. And then if I do need to do something proper with it, I will take what, as far as I've gotten with this, take it off to Photoshop and start marrying in some photographic te textures in there, just kind of blending them in where I need them, uh, touching up things that I don't like. So um, where are we gonna go with this? Well, let's go and do one sat map and a another sat map. So there we have two sat maps, two very different details, two di very different color combinations. Let's combine them together and see what we get. So individually Not great, right? Too simplistic, too complex, something in between. So by merging them together, you get a greater variety of um, detail and you know that the idea of like the bigger forms mixed in with the smaller forms, and then you can blend them. You can say, you know what? I like a little bit of that you know, extra color and detail but I want to simplify it. I want it mostly based off of those big forms and then this other stuff kind of blends into it. So this is one of the first places I will go in terms of you know, creating my base texture. Often cases, I will go ahead and say, you know what? Um, I want stuff that maybe is similar in some way. So similar color range, it's a little bit too much. So because they're very close to each other, um, they provide something more. And the, the closer they are, uh, the better it is to blend towards 50%. Okay, well this is neat, but I, I want something a bit more. I want something that's based off of more than this and more than this. There's some existing stuff here. Let's take a look at what we have with a clutter node. I go in here I look at that that is my where not much going on there that is my deposits the big blobs I don't know it's okay but uh, I'm not sure what I would do with that by itself and then we have the flow lines and the flow lines, again, in this particular case, are fairly subtle. There's not really enough going on here for me to really use. And I can combine them together. I can blend them together to get something. Uh, in some cases, it's good. Uh, another option, of course, is going the auto level route. And 
in here auto level is brought back a bit more but not not much we'll go logarithmic and there we go there's much more coming off of that so that's pretty cool um, how about the wear in this particular case And there we go, we've got some interesting kind of flow patterns combined with you know, areas where it's obviously you know, worn down the surface, it's eaten away at the surface. So I could use that. Alternatively, I could turn to some of these other um, mask systems. So if I went with uh, flow and increase the rain cycles a fair bit, and apply that. And now I have flow patterns. So much of what I've gotten off of this may give you an indication of where some of that information is coming from. Um, that's that's cool. I could also go with velocity. And velocity, uh, keep in mind that it has an angle to it, so it's the direction that all the rainfall is, is hitting. So um, on a three-dimensional shape, like a, um, a mountain or whatever, um, versus this kind of flat shape uh, it will be more focused on one side than another but this is good we've got lots of uh, flow patterns from there and we've got the initial flow what about we take those two we combine them together and I will do something like that and compare it to our flow, um, our soil. So um, soil grabs into the crevices a little bit more, it bleeds out from that a little bit more, but this is very similar to that, but I have now control, I have more balance between the, the two of them. Now um, the advantage that soil has also is that soil will go omnidirectional, whereas velocity has very much a directional side to it, so one side versus another. But I can play with this, uh, find an interesting sort of balance. I'm going to then combine it with this. So that gives us uh, some patterns. Let's go full with that. So they fully blend. So there we go. We've got the, uh, the flow patterns coming off of it and um, it's coming off of the original wear and, and flow patterns from the erosion mixed together. I'm going to take this, I'm going to do a color effects on it, hue saturation, pull the levels down, pull the saturation up a little bit. And we'll take these two, combine them as a mixer, 100%, and we'll use this to mask. So now I've added another layer of complexity to this, right? I've got a region which has darkened based off of that information. In fact, I could probably go even stronger since my mask itself is not that powerful. I can also auto level it again to make sure that I get it really strong. 
And some of that stuff, it's it's in cracks, so it won't uh, be as visible. So there we go. So now I've controlled it so that I have you know an area that's maybe a little bit damper than the others because that's where the water regularly flows, and the other places where it is over here, it's had time to dry off. What other things can I do with this? Well, we continue to play around. How about something like slope? So slope, I can increase the fall off a little bit further. We've got some regions in the top here, catching the tops of these but I don't want all this stuff down at the bottom. So I'll go ahead and grab myself a height. Sometimes it's good just to drag it in and then just drag the connection because it likes to drop stuff at the bottom. Go all the way up to the top. And we'll bring you up to the top and maybe we'll extend that fall off a little bit something like that. Combine. Make that 100% and multiply it. And there we go, just the top. Cool. This has more detail to it, but um, the detail is heavily based off of this pattern here. And I want to put grass up here. And that's kind of a weird pattern to base grass off, off of. But um, I do want some of it, I just don't really want it to be 100% based off of that. And if I look at this, well, this has got that pattern again, but, you know, uh, so I, I want to I want to find another solution. This comes from realizing that not everything has to be based 100% on this surface. If you have detail like grass shape and stuff like that that you've masked up into that region, sure go ahead and use that, you know, um, drive, you know, your textures from, from soil and all that kind of stuff and be based off of these things. But I don't have that. I haven't done that. And I don't necessarily want to do that. Maybe it's too far away to see those kind of details in the surface. I want to see it from, you know, grass. Uh, another thing is that grass also changes different colors because there's different breeds of grass. And there may be points where you know, some of it's like a little bit browned and whatnot. And so we have to come up with different solutions to get there. So what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to uh, bring in something else. I'll bring in a Perlin noise. And we'll add a few extra octaves in there. Although I think at this resolution, it's not going to make a big difference. We will go ahead and do a soil off of that. So that gives us this kind of pattern. And I will combine it with this. So we'll go to our sat maps, drag and drop, look for something grassy, Let's go to the green, it's not bad but there might be something better. I'll probably go with the yellows and browns a little bit better. And I want to mix that in. Grab those, merge them, and bring in my mask. It's 
so there it is blend into, into the top with all the, the colors that are in there decide how much of that we want to come in and there we are we've got ourselves some nice grass at the top we've got some wet areas of flow and some other areas of flow and everything is wonderful and splendid so this is the process that I go through for texturing this is really just a simple shape we'll take a look at one more really quickly and talk about uh, some some other ideas so here we are in a simple scene again I'm gonna grab a Perlin noise I'm gonna go ahead and auto level that and I'm gonna do something somewhat crazy I am going to go in and do a where are you cells blink and we'll add some chaos to that lots of lovely chaos and we will add a sat maps what this does is it will spread color Now we can also um, take this and add some noise to it to really spread that out detail wise or we can go through a process to blur it. Now unfortunately there isn't an easy way to blur but we do have this method where we can go ahead and um, sorry coming off the sat maps it's going to split into groups and I'm just going to reduce the noise a little bit and I'm going to grab one two three blur notes So we're going to go now and RGB mix them. Just going to grab a constant here. Right click, say pen for color so we can get the flat again. And there we go. So we've gone from this to this. What is this useful for? Well, this is useful for breaking up any kind of um, textural element that you've been building that it's, you know, it goes very uniform all over the place. So let's say I have a grassy field again that I want. Um, we'll go again with a nice little soil on the purlin. Uh, graded and maybe we'll add a soil to that soil grade that one as well and then we'll do a sat maps on there oops and we'll go green There's some nice, you know, bits of dirt and whatnot, but it's very uniform. Let's 
swap the inputs. And get some some of that variation going on in there. And now from this to this, I've got lots more variation across there. I've got some interesting green colors. Um, that are you know desaturating going to warmer colors some they're going to more blue colors and we're just combining them together it gives us much more overall detail across that texture procedurally speaking this is a great way of you know adjusting the colors um, if we want to bring some of that saturation back that we lose from the, the, the gamma adjustment we can just add that in there So this, to me, feels much more natural for a large open space than, say, you know, just that. So color variation, uh, it's not always directly simple, but you can get it procedurally within the system that we have here. So one final thing, and then we'll stop. Okay, the final detail is a snowy terrain. There is one aspect where in order to create an, a reasonable snowy mountain texture um, you need detail in your mountain um, you can pull from other things you can you know do uh, stuff from again photographic reference hand painting that kind of stuff you can you know take it into substance painter or uh, do, deal with a projection in Photoshop and then bring it into like Maya or Max or whatever and then project back through the camera but again if you want to go fully procedural uh, you have to consider the shape of your mountain so here I've got the default sort of you know mountain displace road and uh, through a snow on there and just the snow alone we get a blend like this right and um, this is what a lot of sort of beginner mountains you know look like they're they're just regular snow and you can improve upon them um, for whatever reason when I want to combine the snow mask right now I have to do an auto level I'm not sure what that's about but it's uh, it's required um, I'm adding a slope to this and then uh, the slope grabs a few more edges that are there and so you get uh, a slight improvement That is not the right mask. Let's try that again. Sometimes when you copy and paste nodes, it just uh, instances them. There we go. So that's the actual result. So now we can see, you know, you get a little bit more, but it's it's still not quite there. So really what it comes down to is the shape of the mountain. So instead of going the simple route, I've gone through some additional processes here. So I've taken the mountain, combined it with Voronoi, with lots of things, and just, you know, balanced them to the lower amount. So mostly it's that original mountain shape, but there's a little bit extra there. And then I took another Voronoi, super small, um, S here, um, so that scale 100% to like make them as small as possible and then again doubling both of these up to four and then I'm subtracting them from the surface in small amounts so really uh, complex when we run through the displacement which I mean it's not doing much honestly but the erosion after that fact provides us with a lot more variety in you know peaks and areas and stuff like that in areas where snow can catch into these forms i'll add another aspect in here which is adding a little bit of stratify now stratify all over is obviously not going to make any sense but i want some little ridges some cracking and breaking in certain areas and so i run a slope to determine where i'm going to put it and then i blend them like that so i get some areas there and then i run a snow on that so that alone 
let's pin this for color so it's looking at this one instead. So that alone gives me this, which is of course way more interesting. So you have to have a better shape. And of course, because I've added these other little peaks and stuff like that that are in here, the snow operator is not going to catch them. Um, I can play with the scale and you know, tweak it to the ends of the earth, but a nice fast way is again just going with a nice little slope. Slope will pick up those extras. We add those together. And voila! Got that here, got the smaller detail stuff, we've got a nice sense of scale to where the snow and the rock is, and then you just put your individual textures into those two different areas. So um, hopefully this has been useful to you, you have an idea now of you know where you need to adjust your process, um, if you need to adjust your process at all. Again, keeping in mind that you can pull photographic textures in there, you just load them as a file, drag them directly in. Um, basically just say uh, that this is in fact an RGB file instead and you can use that as part of your initial process to to texture it. Anyways that's it for me I'll see you in the next video.